Praise God. So we're, we're continuing. We're continuing on our series on money and resources and stewardship. This is part five. This is literally the longest series I've ever done because I don't, I'm not much of a series guy, but God's really doing something. And if you're, if you're here for your first time, if you're listening to me for the first time on the podcast, no, I don't talk about money all the time. The last time I talked about money was in 2017, and it's been five years since I've done it. So but the whole idea is that God is far more interested in your heart than he is interested in your dollars and cents. So don't be afraid if you're listening here. I'm not going to raise a second offering. It's going to be okay. All right, it's going to be fine. But one of the things that we found out is that God is not really after your money. He's really concerned with your heart. Your heart is a much bigger deal to God than your dollars and cents is. Um, and I, one of the things that we talked about in just a really brief recap is that if Christ is not first in your money, he's probably not first in your life. If Christ is not first in your money, He's probably not first in your life. The reality is, is that your checkbook is a better demonstration of your spiritual life than how many times you show up to church on a Sunday. All right, I'm mess- is it too early to start messing? Is it too early? <laughs> I kind of started too early, right? I should probably let <laughs> give you a little bit of chance. Yeah, there's, there's lots of grace. So one, one of the things that, so when my wife and I, we, we, we live by a model called give, invest, and live off the rest. So we give, we invest, and we live off the rest. So first thing in our heart is always who can we bless, what can we be a blessing to. And oftentimes when you're in a church setting and you hear give, invest, live off the rest, the first thing that comes to your mind is tithe, invest, live off the rest. But I'm not saying tithe, invest. I'm saying give, invest. Because in reality, the word tithe actually simply means one-tenth. That's what it means. By definition, it's one-tenth. So for, if you're an accountant like me, you would know that you literally, you can't tithe 9%. You can't tithe 11%. You can't tithe 1% because tithe means 10%. So it is 10% of what God has put within your heart. So we asked the Lord, Lord, where would you have us? And so we give, we invest and live off the rest. And so my encouragement to you is to put God first in everything because you will not build wealth. You will not build wealth through tithes and offerings, but you cannot build wealth without generosity. And so God is looking for a heart of generosity. So the reality is, is that if you're a stingy person today and we put a million dollars in your hand, you'd still be stingy. If you're someone that is, if you could turn the volume down a little bit, it has a little bit of spike on there. Um, if, if you're, um, a, a, someone who likes to give and you're a giver by nature, you, you want to give when we put, when resources are put into your hands, it, oh, that's a little too low. When resources are put into your hands, it's good. It's, it's no big deal. You, you will automatically just continue to reflect who you are. So dollars and cents are simply another way for you to be intimate with God. Money is just another way to be with God. Why? Because when you have dollars and cents, it is your responsibility to partner with heaven to say, God, what do I do with the thing that's what I put in my, you've put in my hand? And so I say, Lord, part, let me partner with you to see w- what I do. And when you partner with God, that is an intimate exercise. You're asking, Lord, you're speaking to the Lord. You're saying, God, show me what do I need to do with the resources? Because God is the owner I am simply his money manager. I'm not the guy, if, if you think using the FedEx driver example, it'll be really silly if the FedEx driver were to look inside of his truck and he would say, wow, look at that bucket. Look at that thing from Chanel. Look at that thing from Gucci. Look, the FedEx driver doesn't look back there and say, wow, those things are real cool. I'm going to take some for me. Also, the FedEx driver is never worried that there's going to be a supply of money, of packages running out. He's never concerned that he run out of packages, right? Because there's always a supply. All he is is a manager and a dispenser of what's already been placed in his truck, what's already been placed inside of him. And, and so it's important for us to um, have that posture of heart where we realize th- that we get a chance to partner with heaven when it comes to our dollars and cents. So last Sunday, we actually talked about, I'm sorry, the last time I did this, which was two Sundays ago, we talked about greed. 
right? And, and it's really easy to point out greed in somebody else. Super easy. You could always see that that guy is greedy or that political party is greedy or those people are greedy or that. It's e- really, really easy to point out greed in someone else. But if we use a definition of greed as collecting things or acquiring things for yourself without including God in the equation puts a completely different spin on it. If my acquisition is all about me and I've not made a moment to partner with God in the process, that puts me in the category of greed. Now, what does the Bible say about greed in Colossians chapter three? Greed is idolatry. We ne- we we'd never, you never have someone saying, hey, this morning I'm waking up and I'm going to decide whether I'm going to worship Jesus or the devil. That's not really a question. No one typically said, no one in this room, I don't think, ever has that problem, right? If you do have that problem, that's a different sermon we have to preach, right? But the, 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 the idea is, is that when our heart is posture with, if, if greed is there, greed is a form of idolatry. And what the Bible is very clear about what we do with idolatry. It says, beware, guard your heart from all forms of idolatry. The Luke chapter 12 passage says. So anything uh, we seek that takes priority over seeking God is essentially I- idolatry. And then we, we looked at uh, two forms of greed. But before we talked about that, I-, I think that one of the highest things that competes for space in your heart is not the devil but it's stuff. I think stuff is a bigger comp- competitor than the enemy in your heart. It, remember what, when we talked about the thing that Corey Ten Boom talked about uh, when we were doing the series on busy, busy, the enemy of your soul. Corey Ten Boom, the great uh, missionary says that the dev- if the devil can't make you busy, sinful, he'll make you busy. If he can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And what's business? It's stuff that gets in the way of God. And likewise, with possession is the exact same way. If there are possessions that get ourselves in front of our passion and relationship to God, that's where it's the issue. God has no problem with you having stuff. God's problem is when stuff has you. Right. We want to embrace the prince of peace, not just principles. Right. So we want to make sure that greed doesn't have that part in our life. And we talked about two areas of greed, um, the way how greed manifests itself. It manifests itself in spending, just overspending itself. Like every time you get a dollar, how can I spend it? You, you, there's no live, invest, give on the rest model. It's all everything is seed, is bread. You just spend, eat, bread, spread, bread. And it also manifests itself as hoarding. There's two ways greed manifests itself as spending and it manifests itself as hoarding. So the hoarding kind of likes to masquerade itself as wisdom. Hoarding masquerades itself as, oh, I'm just trying to do the right thing. But it's really wrapped in fear. And when fear gets a hold of your heart, oh, I'm only going to do this because I'm fearful of tomorrow. Whenever there's fear involved, Christ's picture is not anywhere there. So the idea is, is that when you, whatever you do, whatever dollars and cents, resources, whatever you have, whatever you're amassing, if God is not in the equation, it equates to greed. So think about this. You, you have ever heard someone who they working at a job, the job's really good. They enjoy it, but it's not paying what they wa- would want it to pay. But you know, God's meeting all their needs. And they get an opportunity for another job that pays 20000 more. And they immediately jump in and say, that's what God, our God must be speaking. This has to be the new opportunity for me. And they get into that new opportunity. And it's the worst thing ever. It's stressful. It's crazy. It's the worst thing in their life. Why? They've made a decision to acquire more for themselves without partnering with God in the process. That's what greed is. It's me deciding without partnering with God in the process. So today, how do we fight against greed? How do we fight against that thing that causes us to amass for ourselves without partnering God in the process? The answer comes in 1 Timothy chapter 6, which is the concept of contentment. 
And contentment is something that we have some familiarity with as people who walk in the message of grace, because we always talk about God, we're satisfied by you. We have what we need. You've given us everything that pertains to life and goodness. And so we understand the concept in, inherently uh, based on how, how much we understand the message of grace, what God has done for us, what he has put inside of our hearts. And so I just want to take some of that contentment message and apply it towards dollars and cents. All right. So co contentment, let's uh, take one more. So, so contentment, the, what we deal with first is discontentment, right? And discontentment is a dissatisfaction I have with what I have. So it's a dissatisfaction I have with what I have. So there are some things you're, but let's put this out there. You're all well and good to be dissatisfied with. If you're like, Lord, I want to experience a greater measure of a revelation from you. It's okay to be discontent with that. It's okay to be discontent with the revelation of God that you have now. And you want more of a greater revelation of God. This, what we're talking about here, we're talking about it in the context of resources. We're talking about in the context of, of dollars and cents. And, and so discontentment um, occurs, I think, when awareness happens. So you're happy with what you have until you're aware of what you don't have. All right. Now, now think, think of this. Think of it this way. The, the Apple Corporation has built a whole um, empire on this. Think of it. You had the iPhone S, iPhone 4, and then they brought a the thing called the iPhone 4S. Like suddenly what happened to the 4 that the 4S needed? You're like, I have to have the forest. And when the forest comes, I have to have the five. When the five comes, I have to have the six. So do you be, I have to have the iPhone 4,649. Because <laughs> it's just on and on and on and on, right? Because what happens, there is a, you've created a discontent inside of you that causes you to think about, think of all, all, all the iPads that are out there. I, I'll, I'll give you another example of how discontent happens. So when, um, two years ago when my wife and I were, this is a little more than that. We were looking for a house. We we're trying to find a house. I was like, I, I know what I want. I cannot show what I want. And then Kayla and I, we visited Jose and Marisol's house. Right. And I started to call Jose and Marisol's house, the thou shalt not covet house. <laughs> because every time I'd walk into the house, I was like, I want that house. I, the, the God, this is, I like this. This is the thou shalt. I used to call it the thou shalt not covet house, <laughs> right? Because it was just, I just loved how it was put together. Just loved everything about it. It was just like so cool. I was like, whoa, this is awesome. This, this, is, this is so wonderful. It's so wonderful. But I, I, I didn't know what I didn't. I, I didn't know what I really wanted, but suddenly I gained an awareness of something. And with the awareness is when I realized, ah, that that's, and then it, it turned into, I shouldn't be coveting this house. <laughs> this is not a house to covet. Let me give you another stupid, stupid example. Um, a, a couple, up to a couple of weeks ago, I didn't know that I needed towel warmers. There's actually a thing out there. There's a, oh, and some, I've got one person saying amen. I got two people saying amen. I didn't know that I needed it. I, up to two weeks ago, I was not aware that there was such a thing called towel warmers. For the three times in the state of Florida, South Florida of the year that I need to get out of the shower and my towel is toasty warm. And so it feels like a blanket of hugs right around you. Right? How did I know I needed that? Because there was an awareness that was brought. I found it about it. And I'm talking to one of my colleagues. Oh, yeah, I was planning to install one in my house. Like, this is a real thing. This is a real, I had to Google it. Like, is this a real thing? I don't know. It's a real thing. If you have towel warmers here, God bless you. There's no condemnation. All I'm saying is I didn't know that I needed towel warmers. <laughs> Do you remember this thing? Everybody know what that is? Somebody has one like that. How, how, do you, how do you hang it on the wall? Oh, okay. It's like, we, okay, we all have, we all had one of these, right? 
this to me is, and, and again, part of my message today probably is directed to an American audience because the, the nationally, uh, internationally, if you make more than $25,000 a year, you're counting the top 25, top 10% of the world earnings, right? People living off of three, four dollars a day. If you talk to Eric the Flute Maker, Flute Maker Ministries, as a local church, we donate to Eric the Flute Maker. And when we give, it's like, wow, how many people you fed with that money? Man, I can't even get me a sandwich with that. How did you feed? How did you do that? This is great. <laughs> right. And he's feeding kids in Nicaragua. And, and as a local church, we donate to what God is doing over there. So remember when we had these things in our houses? Like, it, it's a television. We, we call them the big back television, right? The, the, we call them big backs, right? And, and for some reason, we were okay with these types of televisions. It was fine to have this type of television. But suddenly we became aware. There was an awareness that occurred in our heart that said, no, I cannot have that television because how would I mount it on the wall? I cannot, I must have the 80 inch one. I mean, it is so much better for my eyes. Like God wants me to see in the spirit. So I must have the big, nice TV for my eyes. Like, if, like how, how did we gain this knowledge of it? And the reality is it's all about awareness. And when you become aware it fuels your discontentment. So it's going to, so, um, so, so that, that we, we, don't, we don't have those anymore. So discontentment is fueled by your awareness, right? Discontentment is fueled by, by your awareness. In, in our society today, we, back in the days when it was uh, broken, worn out, or we lost it, we would get a new one, but now we have this fancy word called upgrade. <laughs> fancy word, right? It's called upgrade, right? So discontentment fuels your awareness. Here's, here's the thing about discontentment, right, and, and awareness. Your desire for bigger, better, shinier, more horsepower, it's essentially an appetite, it's essentially an appetite, and you're never really fully satisfied with, with your appetite. You, you don't eat a meal and be satisfied and say, boy, I'm going to never be hungry again, right? Unless it's he that eats of my, my flesh, right, will never hunger or thirst again, right? We're not talking about the things of God in that sense. But we're talking about, if you talk about natural meals, you, there's no such thing as you never be hungry again. If you're never hungry again, there's something wrong in, in a sense, right? Um, we, we, never really say, we never really say, hey, I've got this car and this is the last car I'll ever have. You know, you don't quite say that. You know, I'm talking to Frank uh, on Friday and <laughs> to, unless it's Frank and Mary's parents, they were saying they, they got, they moved into uh move down to south florida and it's like this is the last move i'll ever make the next move is between here and meeting jesus <laughs> because they're in their 80s right this is this the last move they'll ever make right but we don't ever think in terms of hey this is the last one i'll need i'll never have an i don't want to have an appetite for this and if you think about um how you deal with appetites you deal with appetites in the natural and in, in some way by starving it. I like to say, don't just starve an appetite because guess what? How many of you have ever went on a fast, you starved your appetite, and two weeks after the fast, you get 10 pounds heavier than before the fast? That's me, okay? So it's, I don't think the idea is about starving the appetite. I feel the idea is about partnering with God to see what is God saying about what you're doing, having that connection with God. And that's why this is such an intimate thing where dollars and cents are concerned. Right. So so this is an appetite. So culture will say feed the appetite and still it until it's satisfied. Get bigger, more horsepower, more this, more that, more the other. But in reality, all it's doing, it's feeding your greed. It's not feeding contentment that should be in your heart. So that being said, wow, that's pretty tiny. That being said, let's open up the scripture to First Timothy, where it's probably the keynote text. Um on this particular subject matter. It's 1 Timothy 
chapter 6 and verse 6 through 11. And Paul is talking to his young protege, um, Timothy. And he's given him some instructions for ministry. And he says to him, Timothy, but godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into this world, so we can take nothing out of it either. If we have food and covering with these, we shall be content. There's that word content again. But those who want to get rich will fall into temptation and a trap and many foolish and harmful desires, which plunge people into ruin and destruction for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. But flee these things, you man of God, and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. Pretty strong words by the Apostle Paul. Now, oftentimes this text is used to say, you see, Look at what Paul says. That means we should have a poverty gospel. That means we should all be broke. We should all be Mother Teresa. I don't think that's what this text is saying. And let me kind of give you my two cents on what I believe it, it's saying, because I don't think that God has a problem with you having stuff. He has a problem with stuff having you. God must be the prize. He has to be the one. He has to be the one that our heart longs for and our heart's passionate about. So the first verse, it reads, but godliness is actually a means of great gain when accompanied with contentment. So let's think of what great gain is. We have great gain. And the Bible is using the text godliness plus contentment equal great gain. If you ask the average person, hey, what's great gain to you? They'll say, well, a full 401k. Um, they'll say, um, getting rid of my big back TVs, right? Th they would say bigger, better, greater um, houses, wealth. But Paul has a very different definition of what great gain is. Great gain to Paul has nothing to do with dollars and cents, has nothing to do with resources. Great gain is godliness with contentment. And of course, when I think of godliness, I'm thinking of what's my connection to God? What's my communion with God? How is my heart in passion? How, how passionate am I living for Jesus? And if my heart is in passion, is living in passion towards the Lord, and I'm content with the things that I have, I'm pretty grateful. I, I'm in a place of great gain. Great, great gain, dollars and cents, is not great gain. Godliness with contentment is great gain. So when we have dollars and cents, we get to use that for the honor and for the glory of the kingdom. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying we've got a lot. There's a lot of things that need to get done and dollars and cents is what we, what we use for it. But we simply can't pursue it because if you pursue it, if you look, it says it leads you into great. Many have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. I mean, just, just, Think, think of the people who win lotteries. I think there's a fifth of 80 plus or 75% plus ratio of them that actually go broke afterwards. Think of um, children who work, uh, I'm sorry, they didn't have to work for their inheritance or their parents just handed it to them and they squandered and squandered their whole lifestyle with it, right? Resources can cause you great pain. So, so I, I think resources is like a loaded gun. Money is like a loaded gun, right? You could use it for a lot of great things or you could use it for really bad things. It's said that in the United States, you could almost not find a $20 bill that has a trace of cocaine on it in the United States. You cannot find almost any $20 bill that doesn't have a trace of cocaine on it, Right? So you could use, literally use the dollar for bad, bad things, or you could stay, that same dollar could become a soldier and be used in the kingdom of God. It's a loaded gun, right? So, so, so I, I, I take that verse and I, I say, godliness with contentment is great gain you, you remember um the parable of the unjust steward that we talked about it says how 
if if you're not faithful with unrighteous mammon, how can you be entrusted with true riches? And of course, we understand unrighteous mammon to be wealth. How can you be entrusted with true riches? So it makes that contrast again between what we really long for, what our heart postures for, and dollars and cents. So godliness with contentment is is great gain. Look, look at what verse seven says. For we we have nothing. We brought nothing into this world, so we can take nothing out of it either. Right? We've brought nothing into this world. We can take nothing out of it either. So, so think, think about that for a second. If I have the Lord, if I have great gain, that's really, really all I need. That's, that's really all I need. Um, So one w- one of the things that I, I always think of with uh, with this we we brought actually, actually I'll, I'll move on to the next verse. It says verse eight. But if we have food uh, and covering with these things, we shall be content. So th- there is an inherent thing that we all look at and we say, yeah, there's something about that that's powerful. If we had food, if we had clothes on our back, in other words, if, if you. If you just had, as Ramsey called it, the four walls, you just had the basics covered. In theory, you should have some layer of contentment about you, right? But but if you have the four walls and you're like, man, I need that towel warmer. Okay, I'm going to stop with the towel warmer. (laughs) Stop with the towel warmer. I'm sorry, I was just too fascinated with it. I was just too fascinated with it. So my wife and I are the the, um, the 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 caricature, for lack of a better word, of the people that came to the United States. I came here with, with two suitcases and uh, two hundred and fifty dollars in my pocket, and God's been good for the last twenty years and done great things. And I, I often think of that when it talks about in that verse where it says, "You have nothing; you brought nothing." Like I I went into my garage the other day. And we have five brooms. Now, I'll tell you something. I don't do that much sweeping. <laughs> why do I have five brooms in my house? Like, wh- like why does th- the guy who came here with two suitcases and $250, what does he do with five brooms, right? And I thought about that. And that is not a hint. That is not a hint for me. <laughs> my wife is saying hint, hint. Right. <laughs> but when, when we first moved into the home, we had some workmen and they were um, taking the popcorn ceiling down and they needed brooms to get done. <laughs> yeah, Marisol convinced Kayla to convince me to take the popcorn ceiling down. <laughs> but can we live in a place of contentment? Like, I'm happy to get, if you need an extra broom, just come see me after service. <laughs> but can we live from a place of contentment? Is, is stuff pushing against, is stuff a competition in our hearts for our time with the Lord and our connection with heaven? And, and if it is, my goal and my hope today is that you rethink it. Because that verse 8 says, if we have food and we have car covering, with these we shall be contented. And you, you might be saying, okay, so if we have covering, can it be like Marisol's house? Like the real do not cover it. <laughs> like that's, if that's the covering, God, okay, I understand what the scripture is saying. <laughs> oh, praise God. Praise God. So my, my whole point is, is that I, I want you to rethink in your mind what contentment means. What does it mean to be content with what God has given you, right? Let, let's, let's move on to the, the next verse. It says, but those who want to get rich will fall into temptations and a trap. If you notice, back to verse 6, what's the prize? Godliness with contentment. Right. 
I think this verse is often used to say, hey, we shouldn't seek possessions. We shouldn't go after dollars and cents. Well, really, if we don't go after dollars and cents, how, how, how are we going to have money for this and money for that, right? There's something inherently wrong with the way in which that's presented. But I interpret this text that says, but those who desire to live richly, in other words, their whole posture of their heart is drive better, live better, vacation better, dress better, go to better school. It's all about that greed component where God is nowhere in the question. He's not in the picture. He says the person that leaves God out of it and their focus is possessions that person will fall into many foolish and harmful desires and plunge into destruction. Where's the, where's the starting point? The starting point has to be our heart in posture towards heaven and say, Lord, you are first. You are first in everything I do. Every dollar I have, every resource I have, everything I have, I want you to be first in it. Because th think, think about it, it, it's th that it, it doesn't say those who desire to live richly might fall into these destructions. It says they will, right? Those who fall in they will fall in a trap and many foolish and harmful because that's what happens when, when mammon is lord of your life. When resources encompass you, like when resource is the thing, when finances becomes the overwhelming thing that your heart drives and is passionate after, that, that's all it is. This is your outcome. And the way you fight against that is you fight against that through with contentment. We said it two, two weeks ago, ask yourself the question, how much is enough? Ask yourself, go home, do, do an analysis for yourself. How much is enough? Do I need this? And I remember go, going through, uh, we talked about it last time, a, a closet exorcism. I did a closet exorcism. i uh, like, okay, I don't need that. Uh, and then a couple of weeks ago, Kayla said, hey, what happened to that leather jacket you, get, you bought for me? Gone. <laughs> because I hadn't used it in forever. Like I hadn't used it. I, I was like 25 pounds heavier and it was a huge jacket and I hadn't used it in like forever. And I only wear flexi clothes jackets now, so I haven't used it. <laughs> so that beautiful leather jacket went. Discontentment is dangerous. Discontentment, the awareness of being discontent is super, super dangerous. It goes on to read, for the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some longing have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Now, if you ever hear people quote the scripture, it's always say, for money is the root of all evil. You ever heard somebody say, because, you know, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. The Bible does not say money is the root of all evil. It does not say that. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. So the question is, do you love money? That's, that's a fair question. And you might be saying, I don't love money. I kind of like it. We're dating. You know, I'm not quite sure. You know, well, I don't know if I love money. All right. I don't know if I love money. So that, that might be your position. That might be your position. Um, so here's one way you could tell if you, if you love money. Right. You, you remember, can you remember when we were dating and I would do these things for love? I would come. I, so so I'll, I'll give you guys a really crazy story. This is how much I loved Kayla. I do all crazy stuff. So how many of you remember? And I, I just I, I'm going to throw out a, a little bit. Don't get offended if this is where you are in your growth with God. But it, it appears as if every 10 years, there's always some cataclysmic thing that's going to end the world, right? So if it, in the 70s, it was the, um, the, the oil crisis. In the 80s, we were sure Gorbachev was going to end the world. Russia is going to invade from the north. In the 90s, I, I can't remember who it was. In the year 2000, it was Y2K. In the year 2010, or 28 to 2010, the mortgage meltdown. In the year 2020, it was... 
uh, COVID. There's always a thing that's going to cause the world to be ending, right? In the year 2000, I thought Y2K was it. And I was petrified. I went buying up cookies and creams and, and rice, and I went storing a bunch of stuff. You should have seen me. It was crazy. I was like, well, I love Kayla so much. If there's no gas, I'm going to be in trouble. So I saved money for like three weeks to buy me a bicycle because I wanted to make sure. And I'm thinking, man, that's like a long, I don't know if I'm, I'm not even in shape. I cannot even ride to Kayla's house. This is going to be bad. If this Y2K thing happened, I'm done. It's going to be bad. It's going to be so bad. I bought myself a Huffy bicycle from Target. It was 80 bucks. Made sure I had it in my house. Had, had the tires all pumped. Sitting at home waiting. Nine, ten, seven. Like watching the clock. Waiting for the computers to all collapse. And, but I would, I would have, because I'm like, I'm not going to see, I'm not going to have one day go by and not see Kayla. I'm not going to have two days. Because if the cell phones are going to go down, all the networks are going to I want to see Kayla. I want to do that. So I, I, I bought my bicycle. So I could go see Kayla. Fortunately, like every one of you, you've probably survived 15 ends of the worlds in your lifetime, right? Like we all have survived about 15 ends of the worlds, right? So I did that. I did crazy things for love. How many of you have spent three, four days, three, four weeks researching something online? Say you're going to buy it. And after you've bought it, you said, this was the dumbest thing I've ever done. This was crazy. You made a purchase. And then you turn around and says, I can't believe I just did this. You have buyer's remorse. It's like if you were in a timeshare present. No, I'm sorry. I wouldn't put that. <laughs> You turn around and said, but you did something crazy because you fell in love with it. And that's what, that's what really the love of money looks like. You fall in love with something and you end up extending your resource to that thing. And then you turn around and says, I can't believe I just did. I promise you, if it's that thing that you, you, you fell in love with, if you had spent a moment to say, Lord... Show me what I should do. I want to partner with you in this process. I promise you three, four days later, you're not going to be saying this was the dumbest mistake I've ever made. Because why? You partnered with heaven in the process. So that's what I, how I can interpret that. The love of money is the root of all. Even of course, that verse 11 says, but flee these things, you young man. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, perseverance and gentleness in, in other words all of these things are what we call true resource true riches this is what we talk about when it comes to true riches and of course true riches is not dollars and cents it is things like love and faith and perseverance and gentleness pursue these things when these things are part of your pursuit it changes the way you are it changes who you are and dollars and cents do not become the forefront thing in your mind all right last thing so discontentment is dangerous, right? I think I made that point fairly well. So here's what I'm going to ask. What creates material discontent in you? And what fuels your discontentment? What can you do to become less aware? What can you do this week to become more aware of what someone else doesn't have to the point where it bothers you? What should you do to become more discontent? What, what things that you could do to become more discontent? So in, for that first question, if the answer is cameras, gadgets, fashion, being at the mall, what's your issue? The thing that creates material discontent. What, what can you do to become less aware? We'll, we'll, we'll stay out of the mall. We'll stay out of the car dealership. We're canceling a subscription to something. 
will, will that help you become less aware? Um, wh what can you do to become more aware of what someone else doesn't have? Right. You know, as a, as a, as a local church, we're always very concerned with what's in our community. Uh, we have uh, Freddie here, Freddie, great senior to here. She's the director, local director of Love Inc. As a local church, we're always thinking, how could we partner with what God is doing in, in that ministry? And I think that's part of it. We, if you're more, if your awareness is all about, let's figure out how to fix me. Let's figure out all about me. And there is no thought process of how I could bless someone else in front of me. Because listen, it's really, really easy to say, guys, God, I've got to take care of me first before I take care of anyone else. That's super easy to, to be the number one thing in your mind. But as you guys have known our story, um, when, when just like no 19, 18 years ago, when my wife and I, shortly after we got married, we ended up uh, homeless, jobless, and broke on the same day, April 15, 2003. We still, and we kind of restarted our lives. Kayla was, uh, she wasn't even trained counselors yet. She was just out of school. I didn't have any skills, so we started finding odds and jobs for anything that we could get um, at that moment. But at that moment, we still made sure and look for places to invest into. You're like, man, you, 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 you got nowhere to stay. You should be saving your money to, to make a deposit for a, 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 an apartment. No, no. We made it a point to say, let's find places to invest into. Let's be sure we give to our local church, right? Let's be sure we bless someone. And that, that was part of what we done. And mainly at that point, it was our local church that we made it a point to invest into. Um, because what it did, it did something inside of us. It did something in us where we said, even though we're going through this thing, and this is the craziest thing for a married couple who's been married one, four months to experience a heart, a hope, a hope process was in the Lord. And we put our faith and trust in him. So like saying to me, Hey, I could only think about me. I can't buy it from you. I'm, I'm not going to buy it because I've walked through that shoe myself where I know what it's like to um, connect in that area. And so what are things that you should become more discontent over? Your connection with God, your time of prayer, your time of in, in connecting with the Lord. These are things you become more discontent over. And so today I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that as you've heard these words, that something inside of you sparks to say, I will be content with the things that I have. And if I go to acquire more things, I will partner with God. I will partner with heaven in that process. Let's stand together. So during the time of prayer before we had service, you know, Kayla was sensing some things from the Lord. So I'm going to have her come up and share what she was sensing in that time of um, activation right now. Yes, I really feel that I want to bless you today. And I, I, want, to, I want to release an impartation to you. An impartation for financial prosperity. This is a good message for financial prosperity. Because God wants to trust your heart. So I would like to pray over you. I would like to lay hands and I would like to ask the Lord to bless you financially to bless you with resources because he can trust your heart. That was a good message. Um, so um, if you're a business owner, I would like to ask you to also come because I want to lay hands on you. I want to pray that the Lord will prosper your business. Uh, whether it is you have debts, you know, 
I would like to do that. Um, you know, I was thinking that even in Ecclesiastes, it says, what's the point of going to bed late, of waking up early? Because it is the Lord that gives success to you to, to gain wealth and to get, gain money and to gain resources. In other words, um, many times we, we labor and we, we are diligent and we, we work hard, but then one thing after another happens and then, boom, you know, you don't see the success. But I believe there's, there's the presence of God, even from this morning in prayer, there is a tangible presence of God. There's an anointing that will, that will actually bless you and prosper you to be successful in your area of business, finances, to gain the resources and the wealth you do to build the kingdom. I honestly believe that. Um, see, the thing is this, kind of like in the prayer of Jabez, you know, Jabez said, all that you will bless me, all that you will bless me, that I will really, uh, you will increase my ten, you will increase. And I honestly believe God wants to bless you today and God wants to increase you. Now, here's the thing. God's anointing, we don't deserve it. We don't work for it. We don't earn it, right? It is just the byproduct of being with Jesus. And I really felt a tangible anointing that I want to bless you today. I want to impart to you the grace of God, the ability to be prosperous, even financially. So if you're a business owner, also I want you to come. I want to lay hands on you. I want to bless you. I want to impart that which I feel the tangible power of God. Because the thing is this, with the anointing and the, the power of God, you know, the thing is this, favor isn't fair, right? In what way? That's why it's favor. You can't earn it, but it always points out to the heart of the Lord, right? So I really want to do that. If you want to just come down, I just want to lay hands. I want to bless you. And I want to, to bless you. If, if you find yourself in this treadmill of, man, everything I earn, something happens. And then, you know, some catastrophe, some difficult thing. And, you know, if you feel that you have holes in your pocket, that shouldn't be so. Your pockets shouldn't have holes, right? But one thing. Now, the good thing about what Andre did is as he prayed, what we did is we eradicated the mindset that attracts holes in your pocket, right? So uh, poverty is a mindset, is not just what's, you know, the, the status. So as he prayed, um, and he kind of knocked down and out of the way the wrong mindset. I think that God really wants to bless you. God really wants to prosper you. So if you make your way down, I really want to lay hands on you and bless you and just release that. Right? Because poverty is a mindset. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. If you're watching us by Zoom still, we're just going to release what God said for you. I pray for you, Annette and Milka, that you would have new lenses to see. I pray that you would see from, from heaven's perspective. That the power of poverty would be broken. That the lens of poverty specifically will be broken. I pray that you would see greater. 
I pray for you, Eric and Linda, on the Zoom session right now, that the people that you work with in Nicaragua, that you would get creative ideas for them to break poverty for generations. I thank God for the work that you're doing in their lives. Creatively, oh God, speak to Eric and Linda. See new things occur. For if you learn on the Zoom session, may God richly bless you. May he extend the borders of your tent. May you receive as Jabez did. Pray for you, Andel, that God will speak to you and he will touch you. That any lens that would see lack in whatever area of your life, financially, emotionally, spiritually, any lens that you have that sees lack, remove those lenses off of your eyes and we destroy them and break them. I release it in Jesus' name. I pray for you, Karen, right now. That as you faithfully give and faithfully sow, that the Lord will return to you. I pray you will not sow for need, but you would sow for increase. Just release that in Jesus' name. Anthony and Angela, I just bless you. Thank you for being a blessing to so many in your nation. I release it unto you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Break it. Thank you, Jesus. If you're still getting prayer, why don't you stay on here? If you're on Zoom, we bless you. 